Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, our work on seagrass. I'm also going to include work from Griffiths University. Central Queensland University, Emma Jackson's here from Central Queensland, so um, she need to ask questions about other work around where she would ask. So let's uh, do this. I'll just um, start to remind you that um, in actual fact there's more seagrass in the Great Barrier than there is coral, I have to keep saying that. <laughs> Remember. Um, we have about uh, 35,000 to 40,000 square kilometres of seagrass in the Great Barrier. If you, if you randomly die in the Great Barrier, you've got about a thirty percent chance of landing on sea grass. Is that much sea grass in the Great Barrier? It's an enormous area. We've got twelve to fifteen of the world species. It's only about seventy-two in the world, so it's about um, um, twenty percent of the world sea grass species. So it's a very, really important environment. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the Great Barrier. The Great Barrier provides that protection from wave energy that uh, you need to have sea grass. So, we do appreciate the coral, it's not, not putting down the coral today, I'm just saying seagulls is important too. It turns up uh, in a variety of habitats, in the reef platform, uh, near shore and deep water. In fact it does in the Great Barrier down to about 70 metres deep. We don't do a lot of work in 70 metres, I'm sure you can understand why, but the seagulls down there that deep as well. <coughs> so just for those of you who aren't seagulls people, I'm assuming a lot of you here are coral people, so I'll give a little lesson in seagulls. They are actually flowering plants, they flower underwater um, and pollinate underwater, quite a big evolutionary process to make that work, we'll get into that today. But like land plants that are flowering plants, they do need light. If you don't have light, you won't have seagrass. Very important to remember that. And people start talking about um, sediment flows from rivers, we're thinking about light on the bottom of the seagrass. Uh, they do need shelter, you don't get seagrass on the surf beaches, so definitely the amount of energy uh, in the water, in the fetch, in the tide, I mean, the bottom shear stress will determine whether you get seagrass species or not. They, they're primary producers, they support fish and fish and prawns, and as uh, Dave Wackenfeld reminded us this morning, they support turtles and dugong. And while changing the seagrass might be an academic exercise for us scientists, if you're a dugong and the seagrass disappears, you're going to die in the upstream on the beach. They, they have a rapid turnover, so in a picture like that one there from Gladstone, and uh, people don't like Gladstone, but, but we do, it's a really quite a beautiful environment. Have a look at that. But the green stuff you see there, it's a very, very quick turnover rate. So the green stuff you see there will be gone mostly in 10 to 15 days. Um, it'll be eaten by something, it'll have broken off, floated away, it'll be absorbed into the bottom as refractory carbon, but it won't be there. Unlike coral, where you can, re you can reasonably uh, guarantee it'll be there tomorrow, seagrass for those do change quite a bit. Don't expect them to stay the same because they don't. They do protect coral. Um, they, uh, can modify the pH in areas where there's a little water exchange, quite a significant pH increase where there's um, seagrass, so they do protect coral that way. They clean up that water, the aquarium filter, and uh, recent papers have suggested they also reduce the number of pathogens in the water, so they do protect corals. They generally looked after themselves in the Great Barrier Reef uh, over the last few years, but with Cyclone Larry, Yassi, Debbie, Hamish, Ida, you name them, and the floods that went with them, we started to wonder whether. We are going to lose major areas of seagrass in the future. We were alerted to this sort of sudden ecological <coughs> surprise by non dukes working in Gulf, where we suddenly lost a lot of mangroves. Just because it's been okay in the past doesn't mean it's going to be okay in the future. So for today, I'm just going to quickly uh, go through the biology of seagrass for you, in case you don't know. I'm going to look at those site requirements because they're so important. Um, look at natural processes for recovery because if it's going to recover naturally, why would you go out there and have an administration? and then move on to a little bit of experimental work we can talk about today. So there's a range of species and like coral they range from the opportunistic species on the this side, on the right hand side, to, to the more established species. So if you've got an opportunistic species, they're very quick growing. Um, they, they have dormant seeds, so they're often big seed banks in the sediment they can recover from. So if you lose the actual seagrass meadow, it can come back from seed banks. Uh, they're very quick to reproduce, maybe only a couple of months to reproduction. So these are the species that can colonise, but probably not the species you focus on for restoration, you have to they make it back by themselves. Some of the more massive species though, like Inhalus or Flacidendron, uh, Flacidendron for instance is viviparous, it pops its um, new plant straight into the ground. They're not going to recover easily if they're lost. Um, so the point I just want to make today, I'm not going to go into a big lecture on seagrass biology, but the point I have to make is that if you start restoring seagrass, you need to know what sort of species you've got and uh, how it works. And just because Noah can plant its name on the bottom of Chesapeake Bay, so you can see it from satellites, 
Um, it doesn't mean that because they can do it in America, we, we can do it here. They're very different species. They have species lots of seeds. They have 20 centimetre tides, not like the 6 metre tides you might get in Gladstone. You put seeds out in this part of the world, almost certainly they'll be eaten and washed away. So don't, don't transfer one species to another. I'll just show you a couple of species then on um, this side. Cyanosium. You can just see the seeds there, they're under the ground. You won't see them unless you dig that plant up. Um, similarly, the two seeds down the bottom are gradually seeds. You can only find them by sieving mud. They're not going to turn up where you can see them above the ground. In contrast, the little one there, in the lesser, uh, you can see the male flowers, the top and the female flower just a bit further down. Really beautiful flowers, but no hibiscus under the sea. It's been very delicate. Uh, they sort of hard to see, but once you've got your eye in, believe me, if you've seen one of those, see, those flowers, they're really beautiful, you'll see them really easily. They're actually quite common. Um, just, just take you across the far side of the, of the slide then. Just to give you an idea of the different types of seagrass, the, the seagrass are little round leaves. If you're a jugong and you munch those leaves off, they can't regrow really that plant, can't regrow really that leaf. And that's the centre runner out and grow two new leaves. <coughs> so if you go to the shoot one near the bottom, on the here, if you graze it off, that plant can grow a set of shoots in situ. So there's very different strategies in these plants. They may all look green, they may all be <coughs> seagrass, um, but the actual strategies for survival, reproduction, and growth are actually quite different. This is the sort of nuance you need to know if you're going to start sticking plants in the ground. One of the great things <coughs> we do have though in Queensland, we have this awesome dark database of cigarettes. So the top left hand side there is Alex Carter's um, compilation for us. So Alex went back and looked at 30 years of seagrass collections that we've made for a very long time and, and uh, put them into a, an accessible database. You can look at that database yourself in the Atlas. The 65,000 seagrass records in that database, 30 layers, 300 layer, meta layers. So we have a really, really good history in the GBR of where seagrass has been in the past. We'd never have to ask that question, is this a place where there should have been seagrass because we have that incredibly good database for history. We also got on the far side of the top there, Alana Gretsch from the Settle of Excellence has helped us model based on where seagrass currently is and the knowledge of what you need for seagrass to grow. She's modelled a probability map of where seagrass should be in the Great Barrier Reef. So we have a really, really good understanding <coughs> of what is there, what should be there for any particular place in the Great Barrier Reef. And that's quite precise, it's down the front of the size pixels. Similarly, at the bottom, Gladstone Harbour, the, on this side is a, a map of historic records. On the other side is a model of where seagrass should be in Gladstone Harbour. So that's Emma Jackson's work from Central Queensland University. So at the scale of small harbours, we still have quite good information about where seagrass has been and where it probably should be. If we need to restore the seagrass, we wouldn't be working in the dark. We're very lucky in that way. Also really useful in Queensland is we've had a long-term port monitoring project. So every major port in the Great Barrier Reef has a seagrass monitoring project. Um, uh, just go to the top graph there, that's, that's, that's Cairns Harbour. You can see that the seagrass tracked along the green and red are our reporting colours. So <coughs> we, we tracked up really close to the seagrass yeah, up to about 2007 and it drops dramatically after Cyclone um, Piazzi and Larry. And you can see in the pictures what that actually looked like in, in the real world. Went from big seagrass meadow to no seagrass to it coming back in small patches almost certainly from the sea bank. We did a lot of work on sea bank, sea bank liability at the time. We know that seed banks can stay wild for about six years. So we pushed that, it's five years, we pushed that right to the limit. And we wonder now whether we perhaps should have intervened and helped, um, helped with the recovery, assisted recovery, if you like, rather than restoration. Because again, like I said before, academic seagulls, people will monitor the change and say, oh, it's going to come back. But if you're a dugong in Cairns Harbour, that's your dinner, that just went, um, it's not going to be there. Down, down the bottom there is Marillion Harbour, which is just south of here. Um, we lost the Zostra from Brazil, really in the same way, and it has not come back at this stage, but I think it's going to come back naturally. So there is a, one of the few places where we would recommend some consideration of restoring that environment. It remains Zostra free since that time. <coughs> seagrasses can recover naturally. Oh, I didn't mention before, but uh, even though there's lots of seeds coming from seagrasses, none of those seagrass seeds are buoyant. Um, either the fruits uh, break up very quickly, and let out their seeds, or the seeds just fall where they are produced. There's no floating seeds in the seagrass. But they can move around by just um, viable fragments. The top corner there is just half an hour pick up from Green Island Beach. 
and any time in the water you can get a large number of fragments that are potentially viable floating in the water. Alana Gretsch from the Centre of Excellence has modelled that movement in the water for us. And uh, we, we can get a, a, a range of around about 65 to 100 kilometres where fragments move quite easily. There's a north direction in that though, which is important to understand about where we don't have time to talk about that today. So I understand that sea grasses can recover if they're connected by water flow because there's fragments in the water. Similarly, we just had a PhD student sorting through dugong poo. That's exactly what she's got there, Sam's got there. Um, and finding out there's quite a lot of viable seeds in dugong poo. If turtles and dugong visit your area, they almost certainly shift around viable seeds. I'll see those. The publications are there for the no time today. What we have done with that analysis with Alana, though, is looked at how seagrass meadows might be connected together in terms of water movement and tropical movement. So what Alana showed us, this is around towns, what we have done this at Polk Rapid Reef, although we certainly intend to do so, is that in an area of around about 200 kilometres, these meadows are quite tightly connected in terms of fragment movement. So you'd need an enormous impact to break that network up um, so that meadows weren't being supplied with propagules. What it does mean from a restoration point of view, though, is if you chose a meadow in the middle of that kind of town's hall to restore, you're probably wasting your time, but it's so highly connected it would almost certainly be recovering naturally from propagules. But then you can go to the edge of that network, place like upstart bay and only have a point which aren't being supplied by propagules from the network. And if you lost from those meadows, it's, it's unlikely it would come back quickly. The same would apply to lower. It's not in our model, it's almost certainly that's the problem with Merlion and potentially in Cairns. It's not well connected in really hydrodynamic network. They're, they're inshore bays, they're sheltered and not connected. So the, the message is you need to understand the system really well before you start thinking about, um, about um, restoring. Because if you get in there and you can waste a lot of time, it's going to come back by itself. So just to finish then, we have done some experimental work uh, on seagrass uh, restoration. You can do it. Top right hand corner, left hand corner up here is, is my work from uh, Trinity Inland. We play the plugs, they did quite well. Um, the amount of effort required to do that though is, is enormous. And I've also done some work in Boston Bay with the uh, Fred Shorts turf systems where you put a, uh, you actually get dome of seagrass and you tie it to a frame with the taffeta, so paper tape so it will dissolve. Flip the cage over, put some weights on it so it stays there, and then uh, after three weeks you can take the cage away because the papers dissolve and the cigars are left behind. It is possible to do it. Um, Emma from uh, Central Queensland University is looking at core sizes in Baston to see what the best size of core is. So we're getting that work behind and Nell and uh, Roy Connolly in, uh, in um, Cripps University also at the other side, looking at the way you might uh, put plugs in if you've been eaten by things like fish. One of the things you have in this part of the world is if you start sticking cigars in the bottom, you get a lot of friendly fish come along and help um, take them away and so we need to protect it from that. Also the Kelly NASA, the Yabbies can be quite difficult and um, you have to put in a biodivation mode as well. So we're looking at those things. So to finish then, um, I'm running out of time, so typically you can restore top four cigars, meadows or a system to recover so that animals aren't left without food. I think that's a that we're given. Um, you do need to know that information. Please don't rush in um, to do it without coming and talk to us. There's a seagrass restoration network where it's what's turned on. Uh, we can give good advice. We have that experience in the group, uh, both uh, the three universities I've mentioned. Um, many meadows are highly connected anyway, and they may well recover, and we need to that concept of uh, use of landing zone. If the area that's been damaged by a cyclone is not suitable for restoration for several years after, the cyclone because it's been scoured or there's too much sediment moving or too many bits of logs rolling around. There's no point trying to restore it until that uh, has been restored itself. Um, actual physical restoration is possible, we've done it. Um, look at the two pictures on the right hand side though and just think about how hard it is to work in uh, the soft mud of the Queensland's estuaries. Uh, you can do a lot of damage to the environment just staggering through it and you lose a lot of staff as well. So the sea-based approaches are probably the way to go in the long term. Uh, Emma's, Emma's mocked up a, a Yates seed packet there for you. Uh, this is the ultimate dream that we'd be able to give you a seed packet seed us, so, which has its instructions. Please plant this in, uh, in, uh, in April and stick it in two centimetres by the surface and, um, and water it as it grows. Um, we do it for traditional plants and think nothing of it, but that's all technology that's been developed so in the past. Um, so our dream is that we will one day be able to just give you the recipe of the way back.
be instructed, you must almost run from here to the river this morning. 